Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, so I, I changed the title a little bit, but it's mainly the same things. Talk a little bit about resurgence in matrix models and in string theory, but with uh, uh, some emphasis on polymorphic equations. This is a work in progress with my students who are all here, Salvatore, Max, and Robert, and my collaborators, Anisette and Vonk. All right, so a little bit of motivation. So if you come from the physics side, this could be something that could interest you. Uh, how can I compute non-perturbative quantum gravity? So that's a very hard question. And uh, string theory tries to address that, and it does generically so perturbatively. So that's sort of the free energy of some string theory, which is this famous uh, sum over a Riemann surface of different genera. And that series is asymptotic. So we would like to go sort of beyond it, find a non-perturbative construction of string theory. Not so much a definition, I will not have a lot to say about that, but about a construction. And in the process, it could be nice that uh, whatever this non-perturbative construction is that might be a trans series could give us some hints on the semi-classics of what's going on, just not perturbative semi-classics, which is encoded in that uh, sum over Riemann surfaces, but perhaps some non-perturbative semi-classics. And the simplest example to do so is in two dimensions, where quantum gravity is described by the Polynesian one equation. So if you don't care so much about physics, but math, you care about that equation, which is up there. Uh, that's the Polynesian one equation. And this describes the specific heat of minimal strings with no matter, which is basically 2D gravity. And <coughs> The solution is this specific heat, and you can construct the free energy and the partition function or the tau function by just following some specific rules where the string coupling relates to the z of Ponleve in the way that's written there, and here's the free energy. This perturbative series is asymptotic. These coefficients grow factorially fast. We would like to go beyond perturbation theory and say something a little bit more precise. And this can be said for other equations. So another equation that could be of interest is Ponleve 2 because it relates to the 2D supergravity. So that would also be interesting. The, the equation is there, the, the partition function or tau function is there, the relation between the Z of Ponleve V and G string slightly different. But again, we have a perturbative series with asymptotic coefficients grow factorially fast. There's many other examples. We could have uh, higher order Ponleve type equations and so on. Mostly I will talk about Ponleve V1. I'll say some things about Ponleve V2 and I'll also say some things about discrete Ponleve V1 equations. So that's sort of, um, let's say, more physical motivation. But there's also a mathematical motivation to look at this. Uh, these are the, the, the famous poles of Ponleve equation. So this is, uh, these are plots for the Ponleve 1 equation. Uh, the Ponleve 1 equation has a Z5 symmetry. So um, th there are sort of five pizza slices on the complex plane of, uh, of Z. And it has movable singularities. <coughs> Excuse me. There are movable singularities, which are double poles. This has been classified, well, actually, over 100 years ago now by Boutreau. Uh, and poles can accumulate in one pizza slice. This is the so-called tritronqué solution. On three adjacent pizza slices, this is the tronqué solution, or everywhere. That's the general solution. So you could ask, what is the exact location of these double poles? Well, they, they, they depend on initial data, or boundary data, or trans series parameters, whatever you want to say. But if I tell you what's that initial data, where exactly are they? So could we, could we say something about that? <coughs> to do so, we have to do Stokes phenomenon. And uh, this, this plot, you probably all have seen it because it uh, amazingly made it to the, to the poster of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> but so now it's yeah. more famous than it was before. <laughs> so I'm very happy for that. <laughs> and in order to do uh, Stokes phenomenon, I, I'm sorry, in order to find where all these zeros are, you have to cross these lines where there are singularities on the Borel plane. That's uh, the Borel plane, and that's a line with singularities. And so I need to know how to cross all Stokes lines in order to tell you where all these zeros are. But every time I need to cross a Stokes line, I need to know about Stokes data. So if I want to go everywhere, I need to know all Stokes data. And because the problem is nonlinear, well, I have an infinite set of numbers. There, there's a quotation marks for a reason. I'll tell you that in a minute. So I, I need to know all these numbers. So that's a part of uh, uh, the, the project that we have ongoing. Can we find all those? And we would like to have a bonus, which would be, can we also have a physical interpretation of what these poles are and what this Stokes data is? That's less clear. And this does not only hold for these Ponleve solutions, but also uh, for the, you know, classical Ponleve equations, but also here for discrete Ponleve. 
This comes from a matrix model. This is the discrete version of, say, the Polynesian 1 equation, where R now replaces U. It's the specific heat of a matrix model. And, well, I'm not telling you what that figure is. I'll tell you that uh, in about half an hour, 45 minutes. But those are also poles, double poles, of this discrete Ponleve R. And I would like to know, that's a density map. This was done in a, in a computer. It was a slow calculation in a cluster. I will try to also find out where are all these guys. Can I actually pinpoint them, do something a bit better than just a, uh, a density plot? Again, I'll mostly focus on Ponleve 1, say a little bit about Ponleve 2 and discrete Ponleve. Okay, so that's sort of uh, the motivation. And so I'll tell you a little bit about old work, uh, how we constructed Ponleve series, um, and how we would uh, try to approach resumming them and trying to get some information out of them. Uh, and then we will see that they, 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 these, these Ponleve solutions, they all, or trans series to be more precise, they all have a property which is associated with the fact that they're resonant. So I need to understand where to. Mm, what's the, the good context to deal with resonant in the Ponleve context? And how will that influence what goes on with Stokes data? So Stokes data is, uh, let's say, slightly different from non-resonant case. And I will show you this uh, numerical work that we've been doing on how to try to find out where, what are all these numbers and how they organize themselves. Uh, then I'll slightly change gears, assuming that, okay, so let me already... Uh, <laughs> give you the, 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 the bunch line. We don't have all the numbers. We have many numbers, but we don't have all of them, so that problem is still not solved. But let's assume that maybe I had solved for all of them, and we still hope that we will do that soon. Then I can move on and now find out where are all these poles, where are they located, uh, both for the Ponleve case and for the matrix model. And then in the end, I'll tell you if there's time left. I'll tell you a little bit about resummations and their semi-classical decodings, plural, and I'll tell you why I'm using plural here. All right, so let's just start only for one equation. Again, that's the equation I want to solve. And I want to try to find a trans-series solution to it. So the perturbative solution at large z, that was small string coupling before, looks like that. And I can grab that answer, plug into the equation, and I get the recursion equation for the coefficients u of g. And I just, you know, put in the computer, and it starts computing and computes a bunch of guys. Here are a couple of numbers. They're rational numbers. And the, the, the expansion I get is asymptotic, so I have to deal with it. Uh, what will the trans series look like? Well, it turns out that it's a second order differential equation. will precisely say that there are two instant interactions and in such a way that they're symmetric. So that's what gives origin to resonance. And the two parameter trans series that we obtain looks like that. Again, I'm not going to just, I'm just giving you the structure. I'm not going to tell you what all these coefficients are. So, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are the trans series parameters. These are the boundary conditions of Ponleve, if you want. I need two of them because it's second order. Uh, these are the things that will mm, sort of, quote unquote, suffer Stokes phenomenon. So when there's Stokes phenomenon, these guys jump. Then I have my exponential contribution. You see that because the instant actions were symmetric, there's an n minus m. And uh, you can ask, what exactly does that entail? Talk to you about that in a second. There are some logarithms, which actually, I mean, it's, it's a finite sum, so they're not terrible. And then there are some phi's. The capital phi's are asymptotic series. And this is what they look like. They're, I'm here putting them in as expansions in GS, which, remember, was z to the minus 4 fifths, or whatever it was. And they have different starting orders. So there's a beta, which is going to be important in, in a little bit. The log sectors, the reason I'm not so concerned about that is because they're not independent. Again, this is an effect of resonance. It's sort of the hallmark of resonance in these nonlinear problems is that there's these logs sort of distinguishing uh, Borel singularities. So they all relate to each other. So I can deal with them. In fact, I can just exponentiate them when I move to the partition function and I will not worry too much about them. So you can just, you know, put these ansatz into the equation, get recursion relations, and compute a lot of these coefficients, these u, g, and m compute a bunch of them, and then you can ask, well, but uh, do we really know for sure that it's resurgent? And one way to test it is with uh, these resurgent large order relations. So I'm going to look, I'm sorry, now I, uh, there's a capital F where there should be a U. This is a slide from some other talk. So 
Resurgent tells me exactly how those coefficients are going to grow at large g. So they have, you know, the factorial growth, the subleading exponential growth, and so on and so forth, with the one instant on contribution giving the a and the two instant on giving the two a and so on. So I can ask if the different elements that I have on the trans series, this is at non-perturbative level, precisely reproduce the growth of these uh, perturbative coefficients. And just a uh, a comment, which is because this is resonant, there's this a and minus a. This is actually the picture I should have in mind, but that's just a technicality, so let's not worry too much about it. So, can the non perturbative content, this UG and M's, tell me about the exact growth of this perturbative series? So, can they predict these rational numbers with some mm, irrational information, like pi, these s's are Stokes data, I'll come to that in a little bit, for the moment just want to illustrate the idea. And uh, so here's a test, where I'm looking, uh, I'm going to different order in g, here up to 30 <coughs> loops if you want, and I include in these large order relations different instanton contributions here up to nine instantons, and I'm trying to see how many digits of precision and I get. And you see that I'm above 70 digits of precision up there. So, I mean, this is telling you that you should have some confidence that in fact what I'm finding here is a resurgence structure. So, that's sort of the data that, I'm, I'm not gonna show you any numbers, you can look them up in any paper if you want, I'm just gonna tell you that we have all these data that we're going to work with. And the same can be done for Polyvet 2. So, let me not waste a lot of time in this slide because it's exactly the same as the previous one, but just for the different equation, uh, a different uh, perturbative solution. Now there's a factor of three halves uh, and then a different asymptotic expansion. Again, it's a second order differential equation with two instant actions which are symmetric because again it's resonant, so it means that there's a string theory inside. And this is what the trans series looks like, almost the same as the previous one, so not a lot to be said. Of course, it's a different equation, so the relations between log sectors is slightly different, but other than that, all is the same, and you can also validate uh, this equation, uh, and this solution, this trans series solution as being research. Okay, so now we have uh, these solutions. What would we like to do with it? Well, we could think, maybe I should now try to resum. So I, I have this, all this data, I wanted to, I find a non-perturbative partition function for 2D gravity. I want to find exactly where are these poles of Ponlevet. Can I play with that? So one way to do that is, um, is in the following way. So I grab each block, each phi and m was an asymptotic series, and I'm going to Borel resum it to try to get some number out. Uh, that's just a definition. In practice, we don't exactly know what that Borel transform is because we don't have infinite data, we have a limited amount of data, so we have to do some approximation to that Borel transform and play with it. But okay, let's assume that that so far doesn't bother me a lot. And then I do this sort of a Cal Borel resummation where I put all these guys into the trans series and I should be able to start computing some numbers. So the first thing which I already mentioned is that I still need Stokes data. So this is sort of a you know, quote unquote local solution because I still need to cross Stokes wedges and go somewhere else if I want to go global. So I need to know Stokes data. So that's the first thing that I still need to worry about and that's uh, what I will be talking about for quite a bit next. And the second thing is that these two parameter trans series solutions are resonant. So now I really want to point out that there's that n minus m factor there. And, um, you know, if n and m are both zero, that's just the perturbative sector, the zero, zero sector, that's great. But when n is equal to m, all these diagonal non-perturbative sectors, the one, one, two, two, three, three, they all have the same weight. So we can ask ourselves, how exactly are they playing with the perturbative sector? And is there any change in the physics of the problem that I am looking at? Let's try to address uh, the first problem and try to understand how can I cook up Stokes data for this, this Ponlevy one case. And so for that, I wanna start just one step back and think that I have different instant on actions. And let's just think a little bit about what is Stokes data for general problems where there are many instant on actions. And then I will focus on the case that, well, I have two and they're symmetric. 
So let's just assume that we have k distinct instant actions and some trans series solution where now the trans series parameters are just all together in that k dimensional vector sigma. There's the exponential factors. And then there's the phi ends, which are a symptotic series. Now I'm not worried if they have a starting order or not, so let's just, just some starting some uh, asymptotic series, which are labeled by n, which is a vector in this uh, uh, semi-positive k-dimensional lattice. All right, uh, where are the Borel singularities? So we're on our path to try to understand Stokes' data, so let's ask where are the singularities where Stokes' data is going to be related. So I have this k-dimensional lattice, and I need to project down to the Borel plane to know exactly where these singularities are located. And the projection map is precisely done by the instant on action. And that's the reason why we'll see that resonance is going to change the way that these guys are organized. And in the, this business that we're, at least these problems that we've been solving, uh, the resurgence functions are all simple resurgence functions, which means that the singularities are simple. Or in other words, that there is only sort of two types of singularities, the pole and logarithmic branch cuts. So here I'm not showing you the pole, and I'm not showing regular stuff, so I'm just focusing on the log singularity. So what we see is that at the elf singularity of the n instant on sector, there is a log branch cut, which is a, a specific projection from, from this, this, this zk lattice, and then I see the resurgence of the nth plus l sector in the trans series. And there's a coefficient in front, and this coefficient in front, we, we're calling it the Borel residue, because basically of the pole, and that's a number. So that tells us how to go from the nth to the nth plus L sector. So that's on the way to try to understand what Stokes data in this k-dimensional series are. Now another way that uh, Jean has taught us many years ago, I guess, <laughs> uh, is that all these singularities should be encoded in these alien derivatives that uh, were discussed this morning. And uh, the analog of the formula that I've just shown you for Borel singularities is that um, bridge equation for the alien derivative of the nth sector. So the, 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 the alien derivative is only non-zero if there's a singularity, and we already discussed that singularities is, our, is L dot A. And at that point, I see the resurgence of the nth plus L sector, and in front of it, there's this inner product of the Stokes vector times the arrival node, if you want. So you see that this, this Stokes, well, this is a k-dimensional vector of Stokes coefficient, and these vectors are associated to specific lattice sites only, while the Borel residues need a beginning and an ending node. So there's a relation between them. Here are two examples on how to relate this. Let me show you the previous one. So there were these Borel residues, these numbers, and we need to know how to relate them to Stokes vectors, because if you're actually, well, we'll tell you this in a little bit, that we are actually computing these residues, these numbers, so we need to know how to construct the vectors which are going to control for you Stokes automorphisms and wall crossing formula and so on. And the relation is nonlinear. So if you're doing a numerical procedure, there's going to be some error propagation. Now, not all the lattice sites have Stokes vectors. There is a relation there. In fact, most of the lattice of the ZK lattice is completely empty. They accumulate in the all negative K orthon. Let me try to motivate why. So here, I am on the 3, 2 sector, and what I'm showing in different colors and uh, different uh, fonts is the, the, the possible alien derivatives out of that sector, single alien derivatives. Then I can still take multiple alien derivatives and sort of iterate these motions, but these are the single ones. And you can see that if you think of this as a, you know, creating four quadrants out of the 3, 2 node, the first quadrant is completely empty. And it's pretty much the third quadrant which is populated. So what happens is that this is where Stokes vectors are going to be. So there's a third quadrant, which is pretty much populated, and there's an infinite bunch of vectors that I should compute. On the first quadrant, there's nobody. And on the second and the third, I just go slightly in. And this is true generically in k dimensions. So there should be a all negative k orthant, which is packed, and most of the other ones are sort of empty. And we would like to know, or we actually need to know, all these vectors if we are to go around uh, and go global on, on the complex plane to find, to find all these Stokes transitions. Let me tell you why. So again, the plot that you've seen before when you walked into the, the auditorium. 
And uh, let's just consider on the ZK lattice, direction ith, the forward ith direction. Okay? It happens that, so if it's the forward ith direction, is a little bit like the being there on the x axis. There's just a single guy going forward. It only has a component along the x direction. So the Stokes vector is just along the ith. And the Stokes automorphism for that case becomes particularly simple because on the trans series, it just gives you a Stokes phenomenon, right? The trans series parameter just jumps along the ith direction than nobody else. And this is the usual story that there's an exponential suppressed guy that I need to grab along and bring for the right. So what would be the generic structure of these Stokes automorphisms uh, in the k-dimensional case? Well, uh, let's just consider a for a second, this generalized alien operator, where the only thing I'm doing there when I define this, this G is just forgetting that there's a Stokes coefficient and just put the generic vector V there. And it's very simple to see that they satisfy these commutation relations. So, but what I want to know is what's going on with the alien derivations. So if I, when I specify to the alien derivative, you see that the nth plus m guy has that combination. So the alien sort of lattice of uh, the algebraic structure of this alien lattice only closes if this vector is of course proportional to nth plus m and this is not necessarily required. This is going to have, so this is working at the algebra level, so when we move to the group level and we write Stokes automorphisms and would be a generalized wall crossing formulae, we really need to know what happened here first in order to then write the different relations that Stokes automorphisms um, obey or they do not obey. So we would like to know if this is what's going on exactly in Pont Levé in order to move everywhere, as I've explained. All right, now comes the problem, which is that this is resonance. So I still haven't mentioned resonance. Uh, and the problem is associated to this projection from this lattice that I've sort of been talking about to the Borel plane. So what I'm, the gray, let me just go back two slides to show. I'm sort of sitting at the same point, 3 comma 2. And what I'm showing now is multiple derivations which are non-zero that I can do moving out of 3 comma 2. So you know I have here this going from 3 comma 2 to 4, point 4 comma 2, there is a, a derivation which I can then iterate and I can actually iterate infinite times. But for instance I cannot iterate down infinite times because I end up at the boundary of, of, of the trans series structure. So that's the plots that I'm doing there. And uh, you see that in the non-resonant case, where the projection map has vanishing kernel, everybody ends up on a distinct singularity. But if it's resonant, like Ponlevé is, and in fact every string theory is, then these guys end up on top of each other. So why is every string theoretic example needs to be resonant? Because in the trans series, I need to have some sort of two different expansion parameters. I need to have a g-string decoupling squared. This is sort of a hallmark of the fact that there are some closed strings. And I need to have other expansions in powers of gs alone, which is a hallmark that there's open strings. So they all need to be together. And if, if the trans series is constructed with lots of gs, g-string coupling alone, in order to find some sectors which will be closed string-like, expansions in gs squared, resonance needs to be there. So we, want, we need to find this vectorial Stokes structure in a case which is resonant. Let's see how to do that. So let me tell you now about Stokes data for Pauline. So how would we go about computing it? I mean, it would be great if there was some sort of machine that would tell me these numbers, but it isn't and it's hard. So we need to find some, uh, so certainly there's no analytical procedure, at least that I know of, how to get them. So we're trying to solve this numerically for starts. So if I said the resurgent functions we have to deal with are simple, so I have singularities which are poles and log branch cuts, and before I showed you the log branch cut, now I'm showing you the pole. <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, so that's the starting order so of the nth plus k sector, which appears on the right-hand side. So if I know, because I constructed the trans series out of the Pauli equation, if I know the nth sector, and if I know the nth plus k sector, if I, you know, I can compute the residue and extract that guy out. So I could be evaluating residues at the different Borel singularities. So, you know, there's a bunch of them, let's say the red, the blue, and the green, and I compute these residues and I extract these numbers. So in practice, this would be, all there would be 
to, to say, except for the fact, of course, that I don't exactly know what these Borel transforms are because I have limited data and I cannot compute them exactly, so I need to approximate them somehow. So the numerical method to approximate them is by using Pade approximants, which basically gives you a rational approximation to the Borel transform, and which is a good way to do so because being rational, it will have poles, and the poles will simulate where these log branch cuts are. Of course, A and minus A are real, and when you play this game numerically, uh, you get a bunch of poles which in fact simulate your branch cuts, but they're all on top of each other. They kind of mingle. So, you know, numerically, you don't really know which are the reds, which are the blues, and which are the greens that you wanted to separate in order to extract these numbers out. So you need to distinguish these branch cuts somehow. And a natural way to do so is precisely by using the fact that when you're doing the, the inverse Borel transform, or the Borel resummation, use a Laplace integral. And the Laplace integral has an exponential factor which effectively, can, you can think of it as working as a damping and sort of trying to you know, wash away the effect of the green and the blue poles so that you can focus on the red one by an appropriate choice of the point where I'm doing the Borel resummation. So you can do that for the first singularity. You can compute the discontinuity uh, between the left and the right Borel resummations along this um, this Stokes line, find a good approximation for the residue at the red dot, and then if you want to compute, well, what about the blue singularity and the green singularity? They're shadowed by the red guys, so I sort of remove, I've computed this approximation, let's say, I've computed this guy, which is from the red singularity, I just remove it, and I can focus on the guy of the blue and the green and so forth. So there is, uh, you know, a clear numerical path towards finding these numbers. So how many of these numbers do I have to compute? It's like an infinite amount. I'm going to waste the rest of my life trying to do this. Let's try to see how is the trend series organized in this resonant case to try to see if there's a minimal set of numbers. Perhaps I don't have to compute an infinite amount of numbers. Perhaps I have to compute one number. Perhaps I have to compute two numbers. And I'm done for all of Pont So let's look at the structure. Again, the trend series is resonant. And the kernel is the linear span of 1, 1. So it's interesting that what's going to happen uh, when resonance acts, the structure of the alien derivatives becomes really nice. Because usually, the forward and the backward alien derivatives are very different. But in this resonant case, they reorganize into a way which is very symmetric, or I prefer the word, it's the transpose. Somehow you're looking at the transpose of what was there before. Let me show that in the picture, maybe before we discuss uh, that equation. So you see that if I'm on the 4-3 sector and I want to compute the, the alien derivative with a single step of action A, uh, I just have to follow the red, the red arrows. So I basically I move one step to the next diagonal and I sum over the directions of resonance. If I want to go 2 away, I just do the blue calculation and 3 away, the green calculation and so on. So that's what sort of that same first formula is telling you. But what the second formula is telling you is that if you want to go back, you're just doing the transpose of what you just did. So that those are the, the 3, 4 is the transpose of the 4, 3, and I do those calculations. So I sort of seem to be getting rid of half the infinite numbers that I need to compute. You say, well, you still have to compute infinite numbers. OK, let's see if we can do any better than that. So again, trans series is resonant. What does that imply? So as I've tried to motivate uh, a, a reason why this trend series is resonant is to make sure that the perturbative sector is an expansion in powers of gs squared. I have a, what we would call a closed string expansion. In fact, I have closed string expansions for all diagonal sectors. And if you look at what asymptotics asks for you, uh, or for these sectors, it's going to give you some general formula of which I can say yes, but uh, on this general formula, which is, would be a, a possible expansion in powers of gs, I only want to keep the expansion in powers of gs squared. And this is going to give me symmetries between the Borel residues. Again, let's just look at the picture instead of looking at the formula. So what it's telling us is that if I want to compute, for instance, the Borel residue that takes me from 3, 1 to 1, 3, the blue one, I have to do a summation over the dashed blues. Red, I have to do a summation of dash red, and so on. So there's still uh, an implementation. Uh, oh, sorry, I went in the wrong direction. There's still, uh, it's making me clear, making us clear that, again, there's many symmetries 
And so it's not only that I washed half of the content away, but there's also even less stuff that I want to compute. So let's try to see precisely what's that left stuff. And the, 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 the left stuff that I'm going to focus is one we call forward Stokes data, which is sort of the lower diagonal. All right. So the next thing we learn is that diagonal of all these Borel residues, I actually only have to look at the diagonal Borel residues. They're enough to reconstruct all Stokes data. So I'm getting less and less information which is required to uh, you know, get the grip or knows these guys. So this sort of backward forward diagonal symmetry told us already that we could focus only on forward Stokes data. And it turns out that if you start on a diagonal point and you go somewhere else, the way that the Borel residues, I showed you a formula earlier was nonlinear, so there's a lot of guys in those three dots. The way the formula organizes is that it gives me information about say quote unquote new Stokes vector out of Stokes vector that I recursively have computed before. So again, let's just see a picture of how that goes on. So I start with my lattice, and I'm telling you that I can get rid of half the information. And then I say, OK, now let's compute some Stokes vectors. And we can compute Stokes vectors from Borel residues that start at diagonal sectors. Here, I'm looking at somebody coming from 4, 4, and 3, 3 down to get information on that Stokes vectors minus 2, minus 3. I need to look at two relations to construct a two-dimensional vector. And this will give me immediately those vectors, just out of guys that came from the diagonal. And then I just keep iterating, because next I want to compute the minus 2, minus 4, and the dots is what I just computed before, and then next I might want to compute the minus 2, minus 5, and the dots is what I computed before, and so on and so forth, so I'm computing all these guys. So now I know, okay, there's, it seemed like there was a lot of stuff that I needed to compute. I've sort of went down. Let's just uh, apply this uh, numerical method of computing residues. Let's use all these symmetry properties that reduce the amount of data I have to compute to some sort of minimal data. So what exactly can you compute of this infinite lattice? So back in 2011, this was the first time we looked at this problem, uh, we used asymptotics to try to compute these numbers. And well, it was OK. We computed a couple of numbers. Many of those numbers are not known. Uh, so it was nice. But it's not the efficient way. So it, you, you cannot get enough precision to get all these numbers. So with, with, with the method of residues, we have managed to go on quite a bit. So we already have a lot of information about the first two diagonals. And which is in blue, is numbers that we already know. And in gray are numbers which are being computed. So we're now doing the third diagonal. And you can ask, why are you computing them right now? Uh, why didn't you compute them yesterday and show us all of them? Because this is actually a very computer-intensive calculation. So uh, what I'm telling you here is the precision that I can get on these different diagonals. And x is sort of the x position. Right? So here you can see that there's the first, the second, and we're beginning to have the third, and the x is just, yes, sir. But are numbers integers? Can you just hold on two slides and I will show you what the numbers are? They're not integers. Yeah. I can tell you immediately. Yeah. I will show you in two slides. I mean, again, I don't want to show too many numbers, but I will show two numbers. <laughs> All right, so as I was saying, uh, the x is telling you where are you on this lattice, and the s is telling me on the x-axis, and the s is telling me the diagonal. And you see, and that n, I will tell you what n is in a second, is the Stokes data that I'm computing. And you see that when I'm on the first diagonal, uh, I can get a lot of precision in some relatively quick way. I mean, okay, when you're going down to minus 4, we're already looking at five days of computational time. And if we keep going down and down, it's going to be harder. But the problem of going to higher diagonals is that precision drops very quickly. So I read it to get 10 digits of significance. It's a four-day computational time. And because there's all these nonlinear relations between Stokes data and Borel residues, errors propagate really fast. And basically, they tell me nothing about relations that I would like to uncover. So that's why the gray dots are being computed now, because it's probably going to take on the matter of weeks to have those numbers with the precision that we need. All right. So now to, ask, to try to start answering what Maxim was asking, well, okay, great. So you do all this numerical work, but I would like to see some numbers out. So what exactly are these numbers that you're computing? So here, unfortunately, the colors are not great, but what was blue and is like greenish here is stuff we know. And the, the, I'm not sure what the other color is, but it's stuff which has been computed. But we can guess 
a lot of stuff, analytically guess a lot of stuff of what we have found. Okay, so let me tell you about what we managed to guess. The first thing is we can go back to this, uh, this thing I told you earlier, whether the, uh, the algebraic structure of the alien lattice closes or does not close, which will have, of course, influence on what type of Stokes automorphism relations and wall crossing formula you can get. So at the first two diagonals, it does. Numerically, within our errors, we verify that there's a closure of the algebra. And if we assume that that's going to be true for any action, and whenever the th third diagonal numbers are out, we will find out if we are going on the right direction or not. This tells us that the Stokes vectors are all of this form. So, so this is a vector, two entries, huh? this is not a binomial number. So r plus one, s minus r minus one, up to a number, a proportionality constant. So all I have to do now is know what these numbers n are, these proportionality constants are, and they can be reconstructed, as I said before, just from looking at the diagonal Borel residues. So this is what they look like. Walking down the first diagonal, we can infer relations between all these guys. So we can sort of, starting from, let's say, boundary Stokes data, boundary of the grid, I can walk down the diagonals and construct Stokes data inside the grid. And those are the first relations for the first diagonal. So the up one is telling me that I'm looking at information from the first diagonal. There's a bunch of zeta functions coming out and there's a couple of ratios of the guy which is at pos position x equals 1 and x equals 0. But if I know the guy at x equal 1 and x equals 0, I can predict the other guys. Similar relations can be done for the second diagonal. I'm not going to write them, but they look pretty much the same. And we know how to change diagonals at fixed x equal 1. So we sort of know how to change diagonals if we're on the boundary of the grid. So our hope is that if we know how to change on the boundary of the grid and as we know how to populate the grid, and we're done with those two numbers. So <laughs> what are those two numbers? Oh, sorry, a plot before. They have very suggestive patterns. So they have all these uh, uh, Poissonian, it's not, but look-alike uh, uh, structure on the diagonals. And the numbers are those. So it looks like, but it's not known yet, that this infinite set of Stokes data reduces to two numbers. So one which is known for actually a long time, was computed by François David in, in the 90s, is that number. And the other one is that number there, 2.439262690, which analytically we don't know what it is, so let me report on a failure. <laughs> uh, we tried to guess it, and we're still trying, so, this is, uh, so far it's only a partial failure, we still haven't given up. So we came up with this uh, code, my students actually, they're very good, uh, where you grab a function uh, with a couple of uh, parameters which are integers in a given range. So here's an example. I take A, B, C, D integers, I compute the ratio, so I have a rational number, uh, I have a zeta function evaluated at C, I raise it to the power D, and then I can try other combinations. I can put in pi, square root of pi, I can put logs, I can put zeta functions, I can put polygamma functions, and so on. And this code tries mini millions of possibilities per minute over the course of almost four weeks. And we failed. <laughs> Nothing came out. So, I mean, of course, there's reasons why we might have failed, which is that we have these bases where we try to guess this number is not big enough. Or it might be, say, the result of the summation of a non-trivial series. So, I mean, it need not be answered in such a way. We don't know. So, we still have, so this is ongoing. We still hope to pinpoint that number and finally close this story, but that's what we have so far. That's for... How many digits of this number do you have? This is on the rough uh, of 100. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> but sometimes we fail. Uh, it too. Not going to tell you about it, just give you... Th this, is, this is computationally more intensive, because remember, Polnifi2 has a cubic term instead of a square term. So we have less guys. Uh, we have those, those first four guys in orange was the first time we looked at these back in 2013. We computed them. And now we're having a second run at this problem, see if we can be better off. I mean, certainly we have more data, we have that blue data. The, if you look at these n coefficients, so th the properties we find are very similar, the n coefficients, they look the same, but we still don't have enough data for me to be telling you that there's only two numbers and full stop. So let me leave it at that. All right, so now let's imagine that um, we had not failed in finding that other number. Well, we do have it numerically, so you could say, well, I'm happy with just numerical results. 
and let's now start going everywhere across Stokes line trying to find where are these poles of Ponlevin. Can, um, can we do something about it? So remember this is the picture I showed you already. Uh, there's this Z5 symmetry of Ponlevin 1. Uh, the movable singularity is organized into these five pizza slices. There's a three truncate solution where there's only one guy the truncate solution where there's three pizza slices next to each other and the general solution <coughs> to, to permit a train series. And I'm going to tell you results for the truncate solution. All right, so there's these double poles I had already mentioned. Polynomial solutions generically have double poles. They depend on initial data. And there's a relation between the solution of Polynomial and the partition function or the tau function. And so the double poles become simple zeros of this partition function. So you could think that these, these different fields of poles are describing for you different phases of the system we have. And let's just, I'm, let's just make the problem as simple as possible. Just look at the one parameter train series. So let's forget resonance for a second and let's try to, to see what we can, we can do. And the train series is this double sum where I have an asymptotic series there and then I have to sum over instanton numbers. So you could ask, a very naive question, which is, well, why don't, I really don't like to do perturbation theory. I, I, I hate doing all this borel pade resummation, so let's not do this summation first, and let's look at summing over instantons instead, maybe just using the first leading guy. And as I told you way back, there is a starting order uh, for each of these train series, that beta coefficient. And it turns out for these polynomial solutions, the growth is linear. So this gives you a hint of what you can do. So here's a picture of what's going on. So what I'm showing you here is the different n, the different instanton sectors of the trend series. And as it goes up are the entries of the asymptotic series. And in green, if it's, there are some entries, and in gray if there is no body. So the fact that the starting order is linear is telling you that you know, there is that linear direction. So what I don't want to do is perturbation theory. So I don't, I don't want to be summing up and then going around, so I can ask, no, let's just forget about perturbation theory, let's just look at the first guy and do the direct summation over that diagonal. So basically what we do is we introduce a, a, a composite variable, tau, which has the train series parameter and the exponential, and, and then what I'm going to do is just sum over all the, the, the leading order guys, so the u0 here would be just the first coefficients of that first red arrow on the picture on the left, and I just sum all of those. And then I will do so iteratively for the next guys. So if you want is the picture here on the right, I'm just doing iteratively for the next guys. And surprisingly, all these series are convergent. So this is a result which is known as transasymptotics in the mathematical literature. So here, here's what it is at leading order for Ponleve. So inappropriate, I mean without surprise, of course, uh, inappropriate variables, this u0 is the Weierstrasse. Uh, elliptic function. It's degenerate because it degenerates down to just a, a rational function. And you know, you say, okay, that's nice because that's a rational function which has definitely a, a, a second order pole that I was expecting to find at tau equals one. You're saying, well, but wasn't there an array of poles? Well, yes, there was an array of poles, but remember that tau is this exponential of z, which I still need to invert. That's the, the Lambert W function. And when I invert the Lambert W function, I basically get the first array of poles directly. And then as I put in more subleading contributions, so the, as I put on the next red arrows in the diagonal, I get the second array, corrections to the first, the third array, corrections to the second and the first, and so on. So this is, looks like it's a more efficient way to try to find where are the locations of all these polynomial poles. But you'd say, well, but I still need to go along all these diagonals, summing order by order, to get the next guy and the next guy, and I really don't want to do perturbation theory. I don't like it. So can we do any better? Well, it turns out that you can look at the partition function, and the partition function has a structure. This is the same structure. It's the starting order of the different guys in the partition function. Uh, it's sort of different. So I can still do this linear summation, uh, which here it's just basically a finite guy. So convergence is trivial because I'm just summing two guys. And what I get is one minus tau. So I get the simple zero that I was expecting to find. And again, it's telling me that the zeros are at tau equals one. And then I could do the middle plot and just do everybody else. But I could do instead, say, no, there's a quadratic growth of the leading order 
of the partition function, of the tau function. So why don't I sum directly over all these guys at once? And if I do so, I actually get all arrays of poles, all arrays of zeros. So I get the position of all those guys. Of course, it's still not the exact position because I still need to have small adjustments to their position in powers of 1 over z. But it's a beginning on trying to find the exact location of all these guys. So what does these uh, uh, equations look like? So here's uh, this quadratic resummation at the low, quadratic because the, the, the starting order of the partition function goes like n squared. And that's what the partition function looks like. And at leading order, it actually gives a sort of familiar result that had been seen uh, well by Marcus and Bertrand uh, previously in the literature, which is very much um, theta function-like except with a, with a Barnes contribution. And then as you go to a higher order, I'm just going to flash some formulas. So as you go to higher order, this gets some extra terms with some polynomials with that look like that. I mean, it's not very a lot of things to do. And if you put in the two-parameter trans series, things get uh, slightly more complicated because now we have these harmonic numbers also coming in. But you can construct these partition functions. This is a construction which is very much associated to this sort of um, sigma 1, sigma 2, two-parameter trend series. Uh, might not be the most efficient way to look at it. So an alternative is to just think, well, but that was resonant to start off with. So the trend series that we should be <coughs> looking at is the one which is modded out by the generator of resonance. And so an explicit formula for the partition function of two parameters can be written in a way which is, first of all, very symmetric or very transposed, if you remember this transposed symmetry between different sectors of a resonant trans series. So basically, here of the second formula, the second and third lines, you can think of them as the transpose of each other. And you can do this trans series summation to each one of these blocks, and you can then go in the direction of finding these general zeros. Okay, I have about 10 minutes, so I'm just going to be slightly faster on what happens for the partition function, but basically I just want to show you plots. I'm not going to show you a single formula, I don't think. So what happens when we go discrete Ponleve? So those are solutions to matrix models. So M here is an n by n matrix, uh, which uh, I want to compute this integral, this partition function. And I want to do so starting by going to large n, this is the famous Toft limit, where that combination Gs times n is kept fixed. The Gs is the coupling which appears there in the exponential, and V is some polynomial potential for the moment. And if we do this, then the free energy has, again, an asymptotic expansion like the ones we had before. So don't worry about what's, I don't know why that in brackets, that survives from some other talk. It doesn't matter for this purpose. So here's one example that you can solve exactly, which is the Gaussian matrix model. The potential is just m squared, and then I just have to do n by n Gaussian integrals. And you can do so exactly and find a solution at fixed n, fixed number of eigenvalues, uh, of what we call the canonical partition function. And it's a Barnes function times some powers of n squared times some powers of n. So it's not too hard to write down the exact grand canonical partition function, so sum over all these n's. And what you see is a formula that you know, you've seen already. This is the leading term that comes from Polynville 1. So you see that, well, maybe a similar structure is at play here. So let me show you some just plots for the quartic matrix model. Um, there's a, the quartic potential in red. And these n eigenvalues, they usually accumulate next to critical points of the potential. Uh, you know, either the one, two, or third critical points. And there's famous solutions out in the literature where they all accumulate around one critical point of the potential that usually go by the name of the one cut, or another one which they accumulate around symmetric configurations that goes by the name of two cut solution. And you can look at these solutions and try to see if wh where are these the analog of the poles of Ponleve in this matrix model case, in this discrete case. You have to solve discrete Ponleve. So again, I'm just flashing you the equation again. I've shown you this before. R is the analog of U. And I'm expecting that it's going to have double poles somewhere, which should translate to simple zeros of the partition function. 
And it turns out that, uh, this is a long story I don't want to tell, that you can also construct a two-parameter trans series which is resonant. Now everybody has a T dependence, so instead of looking just at sequence of numbers, I'm looking at sequence of functions, but the ideas are pretty much the same. And so we've done this construction and did the research and checks I showed you before, let's not go into that. So let's just assume that this was computed, what can we play with it? Well, oh, the colors are not great, but I'll try to explain. So this is the phase diagram at complex T, at complex at tough coupling, and we find some specific regions. So the, 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 the either solid or dotted lines are anti-Stokes lines, so these are phase boundaries. This is, remember the Stokes line is when an exponential guy must come along for the ride. An anti-Stokes line is when it becomes of the order of the perturbative, so there's a phase transition if you want. It takes, the instantons can take dominance. So the one and the two are the one cut or the two cut configurations. Those should be bluish, not sure what color you're seeing. Then the outer lobes with the dashed curves, this is where eigenvalues accumulate on the three possible critical points of the potential. And they're all at the same level of energy. They cost no energy to go moving around. So this is a very oscillatory configuration. In fact, uh, Bertrand told us many years ago that there are some theta functions taking dominance there. And out in, I think it was supposed to be Rev, uh, there's a trivalent tree phase where eigenvalues accumulate in some trivalent configurations, but I'll have nothing to say about that. So let's just focus on region one, where there's a one-cut solution, and the green region, where there's a three-cut solution. So how are these things behaving? So I go directly to the matrix model, which is discrete, it's n by n, so I'm not looking at the large n expansion, and I compute uh, this um, specific heat, the Rs, which from the point of view, if you want of orthogonal polynomials, I can think of constructing orthogonal polynomials for the matrix model, uh, based wh wh where the measure is basically the one that's given me by the potential, and those Rn's will be the recursion coefficients for these orthogonal polynomials. And I'm plotting here their absolute value and their phase, and you see that in the blue region, where there's the one cut, they're sort of well behaved, and once I move out there into the green region, where there's these three cuts and they should be oscillating, they start oscillating. So you can ask, how much can you tell about this, eventually can I tell exactly everything about these oscillations by using the trans series and the methods I talked to you about. So here is trying to go with the perturbative trans series alone. Just You see that the perturbation theory is pretty good uh, on, on here on the one cut region, but then once I go into the anti-stokes it just doesn't see what's going on. So you can ask, well let's try to put instantons, and I put the first instanton correction and it already sees that something is going very different as I go inside, but it doesn't see a lot inside. I can just go slightly inside. And by putting more instantons, it doesn't get terribly better. I get probably a better handle of the first guys here, but I still cannot see the leading oscillations. It's a little bit like trying to come up in the Ponlevik case with grips with seeing the first array of pulls. So then we can do this uh, linear analytic trans series summation to leading order in GS and I see the first hump. So that's like seeing the first array of zeros. But again, I don't like to do perturbation theory, I don't want to keep going. I, well, we can keep going and do next to leading, I see the second array of zeros, I see the second oscillation and on and so forth. But of course the punchline, as you probably all have guessed, is that if I'm going to do the quadratic case, I already get immediately the picture of all these oscillations in one go. They're not all perfect. You see that, for instance, that black dot over there is slightly lower. I mean, it does see that there's an oscillation, but it doesn't quite reach it. But it's already pretty close, and now g-string corrections should allow me to be on spot of them. And so the real zeros that we would want to compute are, or poles, I mean, again, all these things translate to each other, are these Liang zeros. So this is the plot that now you should recognize that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. That was a density plot that ran for a couple of weeks at the closest at CERN. And we can now reproduce that plot with basically specific positions. So the question is whether you know, this final trans series can still be resummed and get exact positions of everybody or not. All right, so I have five minutes left, so let me just be very quick. In fact, I don't have a lot to say about these semi-classical decodings. Um, so non-perturbative definitions are great, but they're not always available in string theory. And perturbation theories is pretty intuitive, so I kind of know what's going on because I look at this sum 
over uh, Riemann surfaces of different genera, but they are certainly incomplete across parameter space. So I already showed you that if I just take perturbation theory, I'll never be able to see any of those zeros there. So I need to do better. Oops. And so resurgence tells me that I should complete perturbation theory with non-perturbative trans series. And uh, Marcos likes this, uh, this idea of semi-classical decoding where I have this black box and I want to understand this black box uh, with semi-classics. So the trans series is sort of translating for me what are the different semi-classicals which are important in different regions of parameter space. So can we play this game here for this, we can think of, you know, uh, the pont levé solution, the zeros of pont levé and I have this, um, this, this, this decoding via the trans series that I've shown you, and you can ask, can I understand what are the different semi-classics that are at play in this trans series? Okay? So again, let me just flash you things that you've already seen. So that was the Pont-Levé 1 equation, which had this perturbative intuitive um, expansion, and that was the two-parameter trans series solution. And I want to now not only understand the perturbative guys, but also have some intuitive grasp on the non-perturbative guys. And so there's one way to try to approach it, is just to stay within the realm of 2D gravity. And then I can say, I don't know, the zero, zero sector is the string expansion. That's perturbative 2D gravity. The n slash zero sectors, these are some objects, non-perturbative objects we know in string theory, which are known as ZZ brains. So I can see them there as well. But if I start looking at the generalized instanton, so the n slash m sectors, Maybe the interpretation is not so obvious, and it might not be so obvious because the semi-classics might be clear with a different reorganization of the trans series. This is not necessarily that when you write a trans series, you immediately wrote it in the way that the semi-classical decoding is obvious. And that's, of course, associated again to resonance. I already told you this. When n is equal to m, all the diagonal non-perturbative sectors have the same weight. So what should we be doing? Well, we should be modding out the trans series by the generator of the resonance. So this is what the free energy, I showed you a similar formula for the partition function. This is what the free energy should look like. And now let's just focus, let's forget about the instanton corrections of this reorganization of the trans series and just look at the first line. So what is this first line exactly? So if you use explicit data, again, I'm not showing you a lot of numbers, but please trust me. If you use explicit data that we have for the trans series, it turns out that you can rewrite the first guy, so the sum over all the diagonal sectors, in this way. And, you know, maybe the, the mathematician half of you will say this doesn't mean anything, but maybe the physics half of you will say, well, I've seen this formula before. Because this looks very much like so the product of sigma 1 and sigma 2 looks like something which is usually goes by the name of a chen panther factor. And these guys are genus G H puncture contributions to an open string um, a partition function with the correct powers of GS. So then, it, you know, it, it's quite fast actually to think that what you should do is to introduce in a Tuft-like parameter, S, which is the product of GS times the Chen pattern factor, sigma 1 times sigma 2, and then a Tuft-like limit where GS goes to 0 and sigma 1, sigma 2 goes to infinity at fixed S. And you find that that guy is actually reorganizing into a closed string theory. And but, it involves a modulus dependence. Now it depends on S, this is a Tuft-like parameter. So you can ask, what exactly is going on? There seems to be some topological strings inside these minimal Pont-Levé strings. And yes, I mean, this relates, this is not exactly their answer, but it relates to the answer of Bonelli et al, based on earlier work by Gamayun and Yorgov and Lizovi, that there is in fact a topological string inside this Pont-Levé strings, which is given by uh, basically the Nekrasov-Akunka of dual partition function at that specific uh, gauge theory conformal point. So here's the question. That guy depends on a modulus. So again, it has to be one of the cases that Jean was telling us earlier today that this is not a case of equational resurgence like the whole Pont-Levé story so far has been. Uh, because in order to compute those guys, I need to use something which is known as the holomorphic anomaly equations, which are co-equational resurgent kind of things. And this is work in progress, and the little introduction to what we're trying to do, you can see in the talk by Sozan, so that will continue there. But I'm afraid that, for me, the time is up, so let me just tell you that I hope I've convinced you that these resurgence trans series solutions work well for polymorphic equations, and that we actually we don't know the full set of polymorphic Stokes data, but we know a lot already. Uh, well, I'm, okay, we can always know more, but... Um, 
we find these movable singularities in the discrete case, in the continuous case. We have a pretty good handle of where they are and we're approaching hopefully exact expressions, doing some sort of uh, exact WKV. Uh, and semi-classical decoding is, should be thought of semi-classical decodings because depending on how you look at, how you write the train series, you get different semi-classicals out. Of course, there's still many open things. We don't know the whole set of Stokes data, not yet. We can ask whether there's more semi-classical decodings than the ones that I've showed you, maybe. And whether this, you know, whatever Stokes automorphisms we're going to write in the end is wall crossing like formulae, we're going to have module properties, say, for the partition function, for the tau function, and get a, a you know, closed form expression for the full non-perturbative partition function. There is a proposal by Bertrand Ma uh, Marcos uh, for, for the matrix model. And it should be somewhat very similar to that with the, an added uh, novelty coming from uh, resonance, let's say. And um, that's about it. I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, at some point, uh, very early in your talk, you said you have reduced to small and small non parameters. And then before you get just two numbers, I think you get like genetic series and two variables. Yeah, is it true? Let's go back to see what it's exactly you want. So the two numbers were those. So that you want before? Yeah, it was before. I think you get something reduced to functions on two variables, uh, kind of these two indices. Yes, yeah, so sometimes for me, I get confused. Uh, we get vectors. Yeah, Was that the vectors that you were asking? So we get so the, the Stokes Stokes vectors yeah. are vectors of which we know, the, say the x and the y entry. Ah, uh, uh, you should shoot guesses and and then we need those guys. So yeah, those yeah. guys, they're, th those are labels. They tell me basically which diagonal am I looking at yeah. and where on x I am. So it's uh, just a way to label all these numbers. But all these numbers then satisfy this sort of relation. So if I know the first sort, if I know how to start the Recursion, then I can yeah, go but walk yeah, down the diagonal. Maybe Jean Pierre has something interesting to say. I have a question. So, you, for point of view two, yeah. in general point of view two, you have a parameter alpha? We, we have not, we have put alpha to zero. So I'm sorry. The <coughs> for zero, yes, yes, yes. Uh, for zero is similar to point of view one. Yes. But each alpha is Definitely. zero. You have a two or zero instant on. I agree. You, We've just an alpha equals zero. The, 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 the non-results that I've showed you, <coughs> which was this, is when alpha is equal to zero. And that's what's ongoing. Okay. So maybe at some stage we will do alpha non zero, but not yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>